Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're all well. I'm speaking to you from the unceded territories of Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanish peoples, and I'm pleased to welcome you to a session on religion and bioregionalism in Canada. In a number of academic contexts over the last few decades, many of us have been asked to reflect on the religious landscape of Canada's five main regions. We might focus on traditional headcounts. Uh, there are X many Muslims here, Y many Lutherans there. And then we might address differing forms of secularization, examples of revitalization movements, interesting relationships between ethnic and religious imaginaries, nascent spiritual formations, distinctive path dependencies associated with the political and social facts of specific regions, provinces, or cities. Now there's good reason we've compared and contrasted regions and cities in this way, and I've learned a lot from my peers and friends over the years from these discussions. Although we often use the metaphor of religious landscape, we often don't think much about land, water, watersheds, weather, climate, mountains, and so on. In this session, we want to approach the religious situation of Canada from a somewhat different manner. We start with the traditional five region breakdown of Canada, and of course, many of the traditional ways of describing and interpreting religion, spirituality, and irreligion will be evident. But I hope we can focus in particular on the ways distinctive natural and cultural features of these five regions influence religious phenomena. Participants are asked to think beyond the specific religious communities with which they might be familiar and with which they are kind of well known as scholars, and to pay attention instead to the impact of the natural and built environments on the current state of religion in their region to the extent that they can do that. Now, as some of you uh, may know, uh, I was the PI of an interdisciplinary and international research project that looked at the Pacific Northwest or the Cascadia bioregion. It just came out with UBC Press. And that project, uh, in that project, we were interested in the bioregion as such, which is not to say that we ignored the border, but just to say that we wanted to think together about, that, about whether there was something about the region's flora, fauna, forests, and governing narratives that might explain why the religious and spiritual, but also the kind of post-religious life of the region has always been distinctive and looks quite distinctive uh, sociologically and anthropologically. As a project drew to a close, it occurred to me that it might be worthwhile to ask colleagues embedded in other regions to reflect on the relationship they see between the natural and built particularities of their bioregions and the observable or felt religious and spiritual facts or sensibilities of their regions and spaces. So today we'll hear from five people, most of whom will be familiar to most of you, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, I can tell you that we begin on the East Coast with Rubina Ramji from Cape Breton University. Uh, next, Solange Lefebvre from the University of Montreal will take us into Quebec. Then Pamela Clausen from the University of Toronto will reflect, reflect on bioregionalism and the Ontarian religious landscape. Following that, Alison Marshall from Brandon University will provide an account of the situation as she sees it on the prairies, and then Rachel Brown from the University of Victoria will share with you some of the main insights that emerged from our Cascadia research project of which she was a member. Now, I've asked my colleagues uh, to limit their comments to five or six minutes, which ought to leave about 20 minutes or so for discussion with the audience. And I'm really interested in hearing from you, uh, those of you in the audience, uh, about your experiences as scholars and really as residents in these uh, regions. So, now let's turn the podium over to Ruby. Hi everyone, um, I come from Cape Breton University in Cape Breton Island, which is uh, in the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq in Unamagi. And I would like to acknowledge that before I start because it is a very large part of what we would see in terms of bioregionalism in Cape Breton and in Nova Scotia as a whole. Um, I know that in uh, Paul's book, one of the authors, uh, Chelsea Horton, talked about the idea of uh, Indigenous communities coming together and building pride and the idea of activism. And that is very true for Nova Scotia. It is actually a very large part of the uh, Mi'kmaq community and as well as the political arena. Um, therefore, the Indigenous spirituality exists in Cape Breton, but as a bricolage. It is very much still tied to the Catholic Church. Um, even though there are um, the sweat lodges and the houses and other uh, ceremonies, we have uh, drum ceremonies, we have building um, things like um, dream catchers, all of these different things that have brought uh, the idea of spirituality to other people, but it's still tied to the Catholic Church. Um, what is interesting is in Nova Scotia, the way that um, I would see 
what we, what Paul calls reverential naturalism, which I love, the idea of finding nature as a mystical or inclusive idea of theism, that is very much a large part of what is happening in Nova Scotia. What we see is that um, the existence of certain uh, places exist that use nature and the bioregion to, in a sense, expand and incorporate uh, their religious ideas. And so there are very uh, specific places that include that. One of them, and I'm gonna show you some images of them just so you can see them uh, on the website. I'm just gonna share my screen with you. Can anybody see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. And of course, it doesn't want to go there. Ted, is, is, <laughs> are you maybe not permitted? <clears throat> I think Ted said everyone was permitted. Yeah, I don't know what exactly was is going on, but I do know that in some places um, there are some images that can't come up. I just wanted to mm. show you uh, images of uh, in institutions that actually exist in Nova Scotia. One of them is the Seton Spirituality Center, uh, which is actually considered to be um, one of those places that has taken in the idea of spirituality all around it and using that to, in a sense, create an atmosphere of what they say is quiet, peaceful, uh, allowing you to find your deepest self. It is actually owned by the United Church, but it is open to other religious institutions, but they have tied in the idea of the bioregion in which it is situated. It is actually in, um, in a beautiful area in, uh, in Cape Breton, and the they offer retreats, um, and the reason that they use these retreats is to say that the open skies, the fresh winds, the surging surf, and quiet waters serve as an opening to God. And so they're using uh, a very Christian way of saying that the region itself actually allows people to find God in a much deeper way. And so that's in Terrence Bay, and that actually started in 1938. The Sisters of Charity in Halifax actually run those retreats, and they're, as I said, open to anybody. So Seton Hall, as soon as you go and actually look up uh, the Seton Spirituality Center, the first thing you will see is just the environment. That's actually what I, what I wanted to show you, is that in each of these images, the environment, the ocean, the landscape is more important than the actual place itself. The other is the Tadman Gush Center, which is actually also run by the United Church and says that they stand for spirituality and for uh, leadership and social justice, but also use the idea of stargazing, uh, wind, water as ways of understanding spirituality and social justice. One of the things that they claim to do um, is that they are keepers of the earth and keepers of the water, which is a large part of Mi'kmaq spirituality in terms of maintaining that tradition. The other one that we have that maintains a religious tradition but uses nature is Gampo Abbey, which is in Pleasant Bay. Uh, Gampo Abbey is at in a very beautiful uh, situation in terms of where they are located geographically. Um, and Pema Chodron, who is one of the um, head uh, nuns there at the time, says that she loves the Ardala of the place. And what she meant by that was the natural spirit of the place, the animals, which are wild, they are survivors, and the natural beauty of it wakes people up. And she actually said that the most dull, slothful person will be woken up just by the surroundings. And that is what they come to in order to train for spiritual warriorship. So for her, the surroundings are more important than the actual retreat themselves. And people come for um, multiple times in terms of three years or one year or even a few months. But the idea is that nature is a large part of finding that spirituality and becoming a warrior of the earth and maintaining it for uh, sentient beings. And one of the things that they have incorporated by using the bioregion is uh, to what they call the lobster release. Uh, they call it the life release, where every year they will go out and they will buy one fisherman's haul of lobster and then everybody in the community, including all of the people at the Abbey, will go out and release all of the lobsters that they bought. Usually they buy about 200 pounds of lobster and it is a very big deal bringing that idea of sentient beings being a very large part of the community um, and, uh, and they've, they've been very well um, accepted for that. In fact, it's quite amazing how many people actually show up. Uh, for the lobster release, the life release. The last one that actually shows up 
that is interesting um, is a place called uh, a, a company called Sacred Mystical Journeys, and they actually use Nova Scotia as one of the reasons to come there to offer literally what they said was a spiritual journey because they believe that the land is steeped in ancient wisdom. So they have incorporated this idea that in a sense you can you can have a, sp a spiritual journey because of the land in which you are in. And so basically they say that they hold these in, in very specific places. That they've had it in Greece, they've had it in Italy, um, and Malta, Sicily, Egypt, France, and Nova Scotia was uh, one of those last places before COVID where they actually held a spiritual retreat. And they literally said that in order to visit these sacred sites, this is how you will truly find your inner self and have a sacred experience that is unique only to those who are in that land. And the idea is to go out and to visit and to immerse yourself into the watershed, into the region itself, and to understand what is going on in order to have a spiritual experience. So what is happening in Nova Scotia is not as, um, I would say, mystical as you would find in, say, the Cascadia region, where people go out into nature, and that becomes, in a sense, a religious experience for themselves. It's tied very much to organizations and religious institutions now using the bioregion to claim that you can have a much better religious experience or a stronger religious experience than you could just being in the institution. That's what's happening in Nova Scotia. Thank you, Rubina. Very lovely. Wonderful. Okay, Solange. <clears throat> I think you're still muted. Paul, could, there you go. To share our screen, we need to na be named co host, I guess. Eh? That's what I thought, but Ted said actually everyone has permission. You you should have permission. Uh, if you just hit share screen, it should work for you. Okay. Let's try. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. There we you go. See it? There we yeah. go. Wait. There okay. Ball. Bon. So uh, since we are a panel and we must speak in just a few minutes, I won't present the entire landscape or bio spiritual diversity of Quebec. Uh, it's huge, right? Uh, we know that there are many new religious movements, spiritual trends uh, that uh, can be linked to nature in Quebec. So I, I won't get into this, but I will focus on two very simple ideas that could be dominant in the imagination of Quebecers presently. And it's quite, uh, it's quite conflictual. So you'll see. Um, so um, because of the early colonization in Insert Canada, there's a, a very abundant Christian heritage. I worked a few years ago on uh, uh, Christian heritage and I discovered that we had uh, hundreds and hundreds of churches, more than other parts of Canada, actually, because really it was the uh, the beginning of the Christian colonization, and 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 it's very it's a huge heritage. So the landscape it crossed by many churches, and and like many other Christian countries, and if you go north in other countries, like I, I went to Sweden, I went to Iceland, and Norway, you find a similar. Uh, spirit. Quebec is characterized by generous nature and vast territories, waters, woods, animals, biodiversity, but among other bioriginalist features, I would first draw the attention to the centrality of the village and its church. So I'm sorry, Paul, because you ask us really to focus on uh, other religions than the main ones, but I couldn't, you know, uh, avoid to mention that. So it's very, very present in the Quebec imagination. So of course, it's not, uh, it's not the same in urban uh, areas. So um, I'm, I'm speaking about, uh, you know, villages or small cities. So ecological debates question the kind of development that were made around the villages by a powerful industrial colonization. And so I'll get back to this at the end. Still the village and its churches constitute a key, feature, a key feature of religious imagination in Quebec. But the environmental crisis may have, have an effect uh, 
on our religious imagination. So I will mention, uh, you may know the, uh, the, the novelist Louise Penny. Louise Penny's, uh, Louise Penny's landmark, uh, she's one of the famous Quebec novelists, and she explains that uh, she lives in a beautiful Quebec village surrounded by friends south of Montreal. So the village is actually not Knowlton, and it is it, it, impi it it's inspires her novels. When her even more famous friends visit the Clintons, you may know she's a good friend for, of the Clintons, Hillary, Bill, and their children, they settled in the Manoir Hove, one of the most celebrated five-star small hotel in Canada. Her books feature Chief Inspector Armand Gamache and his Sûreté du Québec team who find peace in the Three Pines village, where as well they have to solve murder mysteries. So the village is presented this way, and it's, it's very, she, she sold so many novels in the world in many languages, so she's quite well known. She lives uh, effectively south of Montreal, and she, she presents the village like, like this. Three Pines is the tiny headed village in Quebec, uh, not on any map. It is only ever found by those who are lost, explains Louise Penny. So it's the, and this village is really the center figure of all her novel. Her novels do not frequently speak about religion, but about nature, friendship, kindness, hospitality, disrupted by murders. But here and there, they speak about ladies involved in the church life or people attending the midnight mass at Christmas. The church is present in the village, but very discreet. So this is the first, in the first pages of her novels feature this image. So you see the typical village in Quebec with this little church on, on the right. And at the center, you see the three pines surrounded by the house, the bed and breakfast and the famous, you know, uh, houses and personages she, uh, she really uh, exposes in, uh, in all her novels. So on Christmas cards, it's very typical, and I wonder if it's the same in other provinces, but Christmas cards are very typical. They, they feature a church, trees, village, snow. Uh, you find them in, on, on uh, diverse forms. Uh, but it, it, this is my, my conclusion. This, this, th there is a contradiction now in our, in our minds, in our imagination, because, uh, and I would, I would uh, refer to this uh, recent novel of uh, Michel Jean. Michel Jean is a journalist in Quebec and he's, a, he's a, an, an indigenous. And he just wrote the, the novel Kukum which is the, uh, the biography of his grandmother. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a punch at the end, but I'm sorry to tell you this, but uh, he, he, tell this, he tells the story and it describes this, this village we love, you know, with the church and the houses, but he also describes the industrial activities around the village and destroying the natural environment. So now Quebec is really, uh, st stuck into this very difficult debate about uh, our way of life and the way we're destroying nature everywhere. And you may have, uh, have heard about the caribou forestier, the woodland caribou, that could disappear. Uh, the First Nation, the Anishi uh, Nabeg, are engaged in the protection of caribou. Many threats are affecting caribou, notably intensive forest cutting. And the actual government is in, in conflict with a few mayors uh, in different cities in Quebec, uh, they, they want to protect the industry, but other mayors of other cities want to protect nature. So th th there's a big debate in Quebec about, about this wonderful village with this little church at the center uh, and trees and so on, and what is surrounding uh, the villages. And another example is this uh, so I'm sorry, it's, it's not romantic, right? It's, it's images of destruction, but that's what we're going through right now. These images of destruction, the Dubé, it's a family at Tikamek from Manawan and their, uh, their uh, ancestral territory was, uh, was destroyed at the center by, by the Siri Saint-Michel because of a big mistake, but it's, it's part of the debate. So as a conclusion, 
So does the fact that it is a bio-regionalist feature explain the deep attachment people show to church buildings, even more if they are not worshippers? How does the several threats to biodiversity around the hundreds of villages question our imagination? So these are the two points that I wanted to make in a few minutes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Solange. Merci. Uh, Alison. Pamela, actually. Pamela. Uh, Sorry, pardon yeah. me. That's okay. Sorry, Always my, forgetting my Ontario. Went. All right. The I map understand. is not the landscape. <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, very bad one. Sorry. Um, yeah, poor Ontario. So, Lange, thank you so much. <laughs> that leads really just uh, so perfectly into what I want to share. Um, and I am trying to turn it into a slideshow. How do I go over You can there? do the one at the bottom. There we go. Okay, um, so uh, six minutes, gonna work fast here. Um, I, I didn't quite catch the current part of what you had asked for, so I'm doing a little more historical reflection, but okay. it's very focused on current issues. So I don't know yeah. if any of you have heard about the Ring of Fire um, issue in, in uh, Ontario, where um, it's sort of being presented as a new uh, mineral extraction opportunity to make us all green because we need the critical minerals for our Teslas. Uh, and of course, this is on Indigenous land, and it's very controversial, and uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but that just puts into place the kind of questions I want to ask about treaty lands, cosmologies of land, and naming the Canadian shield. If the, perhaps the, the, the Quebec village is, is the iconic um, picture in, in the, that, that orients um, Solange's uh, reflections, and I would say for me, the Canadian shield, which I realize is not only in Ontario, is also an iconic uh, kind of Canadian uh, by a regional area. So um, here's a, a map of uh, treaty territories in, uh, sorry, I'm just moving my pictures around uh, by, by my colleague, uh, Heidi Bohawker. Uh, she has a great exhibit called uh, Canada by Treaties. Uh, I'm gonna be um, focusing on uh, areas of around um, Treaty 3, Treaty 9, Robinson Superior uh, Treaty. I'm talking to you from the, um, uh, Toronto, um, which is the uh, treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and traditional territories of the uh, Seneca and the Huron-Wendat. Um, and uh, just I'll remember that, that map for a second. Um, I want to think about, uh, in a project I'm working on now, I'm thinking a lot about geology uh, as a kind of um, cos cosmology of land phrase I'm using, uh, and that Christi it is very much tied to Christianity as a cosmology of land. Uh, and for me, thinking about cosmologies of land or, means thinking about ways of imagining and ordering the world, whether that's through the village or the Canadian shield, uh, including how land is created, narrating how land is created, what it is and what it's for, how it's known, how humans are supposed to be responsible for it. This is a picture of a, a dig very close to my house where there were um, close to Trinity Village Park in Toronto, and they discovered uh, some very old fossils here. Um, it's also a picture connected to this guy, A.P. Coleman, who was a surveyor and geologist from uh, Victoria University, at the university where I now work, um, who really had a sort of theological view of geology. He was a, a leading Canadian geologist and artist um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. And you can see here that he thinks of geology as, as also important for theological students. It is a revelation of the mind of the creator. So, you know, some people might think it's a stretch to think about geology and Christianity connected, but certainly was not a stretch uh, at this time. Uh, I also wanted to uh, bring this then now to the question of the Canadian shield. Um, this is just from the Canadian Encyclopedia, which has been, was updated in April. So, which says a lot. Um, it's a, the, a short, very short article in the Canadian Encyclopedia describing the Canadian shield, but it also notes that, um, well, at times a barrier to settlement the shield has also yielded great resources, including, including minerals, coniferous forests, and the capacity for hydroelectric developments. So of course the shield does also go into Quebec there where um, those areas where the caribou are also threatened. So you can see the shield has this sort of horseshoe shape. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out the where they get the name, the Canadian shield in the first place. I haven't sorted that out. If anyone knows the answer to that question, please let me know. Um, but it, it's understood also as a shield that you would hold, you know, carry into battle with you. Um, and so the shield, of course, is, is um, exposed in most, the, the, the outcrop is exposed in most of this area, which is why it's also um, excellent for mineral extraction. 
Um, I came across, when I was trying to figure out this question of the Canadian Shield, I came across this very interesting article where they're largely arguing against Coleman's um, classification of, of how we should understand uh, geological epochs in Canada. But then I realized, wow, all of these areas, so if you see the, you know, oh, maybe it's hard to see for me, but you see how they've named different provinces of the Canadian Shield. Um, there are also these geological epochs that they name, sorry, uh, and they use a lot of Anishinaabemowin to do so. Uh, so Kiwinawan, um, Anamikian, Timiskamian, um, and this is something that I'm still exploring, but I'm trying to figure out why did, uh, so you know, ge geology certainly was uh, inflected by Christian understandings, but they were also clearly uh, appropriating indigenous names. Where did they get those names? How did, how did they um, decide that when they were going to use uh, indigenous names and when they were going to use sort of, you know, British, um, uh, the names of, of various kinds of surveyors, etc. cetera. Um, this is a question that again, is still, I'm, I'm, I'm sorting out. So if anyone has any ideas, I'm happy to, to hear. Uh, a lot of debate about these names. Of course, Anamiki um, is an Anishinaabemowin word uh, that's very spiritually powerful, uh, meaning the Thunderbird, um, and it's sometimes people's name they, that they, they hold themselves, uh, but it's a name of great spiritual power uh, in Ojibwe communities. And so for it to have been applied to the Canadian shield in this way as a way to um, classify the rock so as to better extract certain minerals uh, is a, a real kind of um, colonial violence and spiritual violence at the same time, I would say. Now, I'm not saying that all mineral extraction is necessarily um, many indigenous nations uh, are trying to think through how to work uh, with um, economies of mineral extraction in different sorts of ways. So I'm not trying to paint a sort of romantic picture of it, but certainly uh, the mining industry in Can Canada has the largest uh, number of mining companies in the world. And I just, I direct you to the um, podcast on uh, the commons about um, Canada and mining, if you wanna learn more about the spiritual violence of Canadian mining. Um, so, um, uh, so as I think about, as we all think about the Canadian Shield as this space of nature, you know, here you might do a nice little canoe trip over here in, in the waters uh, and have a um, uh, some sort of spiritual experience in nature. Um, it's also wise to, I think, uh, remember the words of Vine Deloria Jr., who uh, writes about, right, says sedimentary rocks are something more than we've been taught. He has a fascinating article in Red Earth, White Lies on geology uh, and thinking about how um, ways of thinking about uh, the rocks around us um, really uh, require us to think not only about mineral extraction, geological classifications, but also questions of religion and questions of cosmologies of land and how we, uh, how we understand what, um, what the earth around us is for and how we are responsible for it. So uh, I think I will end there, but thank you very much. Thanks, Pamela. Okay, and now we continue our westward journey uh, with Allison. Right. Uh, thank you. And Pamela, it's funny, I, when I think of, I mean, I'm from the Toronto area, I always think of the Canadian Shield. That's very much, I feel so comfortable when I see it again. And now I live in Manitoba and there are parts of Manitoba where you see that shield and it's just a very grounding experience. Mm -hmm. um, I'm less comfortable talking about the prairies where I've lived for the last 20 years. So excuse me if some of you are from the prairies and you see in my presentation some stereotypes. Um, you know, these are things I've, I've read and learned over the years. Um, I work on China primarily, uh, Chinese religion, um, but I'll be doing the entire, sort of looking at the entire region um, and making some general observations about, I, I also incorporate history um, about the, the past and also looking to the present. Uh, so Pamela gave you that map. It showed Treaty 1 and Treaty 2. Um, which is where uh, Brandon University is located. Um, and so those indigenous lands are very much part of uh, the approach to religion these days. And I'll, I'll touch on that at the end of the presentation. So the way I approach religion and the way I'm gonna approach it today is very much influenced by Pierre Bourdieu um, and the way in which religion uh, distinctively inhabits prairie life and cultures. I also look through Thomas Tweed, his idea of crossing and dwelling, 
and through Adam Joe, and that's C-H-A-U, and his idea of religious or social heat. Um, so I've sort of divided my presentation into different paragraphs. So my first is um, climate and space. Um, the Canadian prairies is well known for its prairie grasses and somewhat, and again, I don't want to offend you with my generalizations or stereotypes, but monotonous flat landscape. Uh, it's a region that vacillates between being very cold in the winter, very hot in the summer. Um, it's also a region prone to extreme drought and flooding. And when I was doing my, my first book on, on Chinese Canadian history and the Chinese community, um, I came across a number of theories that compared the different bioregions in Canada and talked about political and religious ideals. And what, what I started to see was that the prairie landscape really draws people to each other, whereas the coasts, places with beautiful scenery, tend to draw people out and away from each other. Um, and that really rings true in my work on the prairies, not only with the Chinese community, seeing the Filipinos, the Islamic community. Um, it's a place where the built environment becomes extraordinarily important because so much of the year um, you don't really go outside. Um, so it draws you toward people and inside the built environment and away from the bitter cold or the summer mosquitoes. Um, so my first generalization is the built environment is so vitally important. People feel a great need to belong and connect. Um, and so I really focused, and this is influenced by, I've spent the last week uh, cataloging um, a building in Chinatown where people spent their life savings to, to help build this building, which was headquarters in Canada. And, and I don't only see this in the Chinese community. I see communities that come to, religious communities that come to the prairies as needing to fundraise. And that's kind of a religious work that we often don't talk about. We talk about, you know, the altars, the, the beliefs and practices, but fundraising was enormously important on the prairies. Um, and so these buildings um, become these, these religious and cultural centers. But in addition to that on the prairies, and you see this elsewhere in Canada, you see people building monuments, so dotting the landscape with their cultural and religious heroes. Um, Dr. Jose Rizal or uh, Sun Yat-sen, and this isn't unique to the prairies, but it's something we definitely see, uh, street naming and festivals and things like that. So this helps with belonging on the prairies. Um, and then there are short summers and, and on the prairies, something that's very common, Mennonite community, the Jewish community, the Chinese community, Filipino, Islamic, picnicking. Um, so that is something very much tied to prairie life and culture. Religious culture is the importance of cementing these, um, these ties through picnicking in the summer. So my next Next generalization is practical, and that comes back to my idea of fundraising and donating to build these buildings, which are so important. Um, prairie life and culture makes people practical and modest, and we see that re re uh, reflected in religion. Religious connections are made with others, often over distances that are much uh, longer or larger than elsewhere. So people aren't just fundraising in their little area, populations are spread out. Uh, so when I think of religiosity on the prairies, I think about people who are giving money. Um, the rural churches in every village, town, and city, uh, the temples, um, and voluntary association buildings. From the beginning, the Jewish community, when they came to Winnipeg and then spread out to Brandon and other places on the prairies, um, they were building these these buildings, and they, they were religious intent, in intent, um, and these have continued to be extraordinarily important. Um, and so people were not only, you know, fundraising, driving long distances um, to raise money, they were doing it locally too. So there may be few people who go to these rural churches, cathedrals, voluntary association buildings anymore, but that space is sacred because of the religious work that people have done to build these enormously important places. So the other thing is that provincial boundaries don't matter as much. Um, as a Winnipegger, I could say that I'm either Manitoban or someone who lives on the prairies. And there's the idea that prairie provinces are somewhat interchangeable, right? This, this bioregion is, is quite fluid. And so in history, 
um, you see uh, relationships among different religious communities on the prairies. Um, something that's very common is people who are Muslim on the prairies often move from Manitoba uh, to Alberta. That's a very common um, pattern. And so you see these relationships among uh, cathedrals, temples, mosques, and voluntary association. And, and this part of this relationship, this social heat, this religious heat happened through this fundraising. So this leads me to the idea of flow. Prairie spaces are characterized by the flow of people who move in and out again, unlike the coasts of Ontario, prairie religious populations are often smaller, more spread out, less dense, and sometimes more unstable. And I'm thinking of early Vietnamese populations, religious communities um, that moved elsewhere, Islamic, um, the, the Jewish community moved to, to Montreal, Toronto. Um, and so, again, coming back to this idea of donations and religious work to build these buildings, um, this develops religious networks that are so vital on the prairies. Okay, so while the prairies are very different, they do share some similarities with other parts of Canada. Um, you see the rise of urban religion in, uh, on the prairies in the, in the 1900s and the sacralization of urban spaces in Prairie Canada where there were Christian missions and rescue homes for women cathedrals, synagogues, religio, political, voluntary associations that I've talked about. And then in the 70s and 80s, you see on the prairies again, patterns that seem to be typical in Canada. As more migrants come, many choose to the suburbs as the place to build their, you know, religious uh, spaces. So now in, in Winnipeg, we have a lot of suburban temples, Hindu temples, boudoirs, synagogues, and mosques. So coming to the present moment. So today we see a return to a new kind of urban religion or urbanism among younger generations, and especially a turn away from suburban built environments um, and traditional religiosity. And this is a kind of secular urban religion influenced by climate change and the need for truth and reconciliation. This new urban religion is expressed through environmentalism, a celebration of the prairie landscape, Jane Jacobs' theology in public sector policy, renewed interest in Wicca, uh, public art, yoga, and nature runs in summer festivals, um, and indigenous prayers and rituals celebrating the prairie landscape at nearly every public event. So as with elsewhere um, in Canada, the younger generations seem less interested in the built environment. Um, but for the older generation, right, the pioneers, uh, the rural prairie churches and urban cathedrals with dwindling congregations and association buildings that have been nearly forgotten um, continue, to have, continue to have almost sacred importance. So I'll stop there. It's sort of taking you through the, the beginning and the end or the, the present moment in, of religion on the prairies. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Allison. Okay, Rachel, bring us home, as it were. Rachel is about two kilometers that way. Uh, so, and actually Allison is now about four kilometers that way, uh, <laughs> temporarily. All right, Rachel, take it away. Awesome, thanks, Paul. Um, I too, like Paul, as he's just said, I'm located in the unceded territories of the Kwangan peoples, the Songhees, the Squamalt, and Wasanich people. So I just wanna start with that. And obviously, as all the other presentations have, have hinted at, um, that presence of, of First Nations experience is obviously a really important element of um, the bioregional impact out here. And so we can talk about that more in the discussion time. I'm unfortunately not gonna be able to spend much time on um, First Nations communities here um, today. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to reflect a little bit from uh, our project that we did out here on religion in Cascadia, so-called. Um, and so Paul has already mentioned in his introductory comments and in the book that uh, he saw this kind of Cascadia region as something that seemed distinctive or set apart from the uh, rest of the continent. And so there are a few ways in which I think um, this is the case and that we can discuss today. Um, one thing is that there is this really important cross-border influence in Cascadia in a way that I don't think it's necessarily the case in the other regions we've discussed today in terms of the fact that this bioregion 
definitely goes into the U.S. And so in terms of the kind of natural environment, the bioregional impact, um, it is very much a regional one that encapsulates part of the U.S. as well. And I'm not sure that we could say that about any of the other regions in terms of the bioregion um, that we're discussing today in terms of the cultural impact that that then has. Um, another thing that I think is a bit distinctive in a particular in a couple ways is this presence of overpowering nature is what I would um, call it. And there's two parts to this. One is this um, feeling of being human. Humans in this region are small, they're prey, if you will. Um, and this is not something that's unique to the West Coast. As Allison just mentioned, in Winnipeg, you probably feel like prey uh, to nature as predator in the winter. Um, and so, and that brings the community together. And I think Allison's point on the fact that in the prairies, they, people come together and on the coast, or at least on the West Coast, for sure, people see, because I think in the Maritimes, people come together too. But on the West Coast, there is this kind of individual experience of that being prey to overpowering nature. Um, and there's this kind of constant threat of um, a sporadic, unpredictable big nature as well. So we talk about the big one all the time out here. So there's this kind of consistent anxiety of what nature might do out here. And we don't know when or how um, in comparison to in Winnipeg, you kind of know when you're going to be prey. Um, and so there October. Is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there is this kind of distinctive thing. Um, and so that's one side of things that may impact uh, religious life out here. But the other side is the kind of overpowering nature that we see in this ever-present awe almost that happens um, out here. And so Paul uh, in the book talks about this thing called reverential naturalism. Uh, I've put the definition up there, but basically seeing the natural world in scientific ways, but also um, an orientation that's inclined to perceive and imagine the natural world in ways that are redolent of mysticism, panentheism, animism, etc. cetera. Um, and Paul calls this kind of the default orientation in the region. And I would say, living here, working here, researching here, and from out of that project, this is pretty evident in what you see in everyday life, that this is the kind of default orientation. And you have some data on the screen there from our project of folks, um, and here mostly from the Christian tradition or with Christian backgrounds, talking about this kind of ever-present nature. Uh, my, one of my favorite quotes from the project is, we have such fancy nature. So this idea that there's fancy nature and it's always there, and how this then kind of um, might impact on people's religion, religious experiences. So in the project, we wanted to see if people thought that this idea of nature as ever present was a competitor to spiritual religion, or spirituality or religion, or a friend or companion is what I should have put, not because then I could have done competitor or companion. That would have been clever, but I didn't realize that till two seconds ago. So anyway, is this something that people see as a competitor or not? So other scholars like Ferguson and Tamborello have argued that naturally beautiful regions, in those regions, religious affiliation can be much lower. And that's in part because nature is seen as a spiritual competitor to religion. And in their article, it's mostly a time competitor. You either have time to go hiking or go to church and you pick one kind of thing. Um, but what we found that that wasn't necessarily the case. It wasn't that it was um, a spiritual competitor or you only had time to do one or the other, but that it was seen as something really important, central, that one could incorporate into one's spiritual or religious practice. And so in my chapter in the book, I talk about communities, the kind of non-Christian, non-nun, minority religious communities, um, using kind of creative adaptation to bring in this default orientation into their um, religious communities and individual practices. And so on the screen now, I'm showing you just a few quotations from some of our folks um, that I draw on from um, my chapter in the book um, about how they kind of felt like they had to incorporate this into their communities in order to be relevant, in order to kind of not just relevant, but to really understand their community members, they had to also understand this default orientation and had to bring it in. And one of my favorite um, kind of quotations and set of data is from Ahmed, who you see in the middle there. And so he's reflecting on how at the mosque, he has to make these opportunities available for folks. Um, and then when we kind of, when he finished saying this and we asked him whether he had been engaged in outdoor activities common in Cascadia when he lived and worked in Toronto or in the United Kingdom, he kind of responded with a hearty laugh and an absolute no. Like it was just so clear that this was something that he started doing in his community and noticing once he was out here um, and that this was distinctive compared to the other regions he lived in. What's also interesting is perhaps some of this lack of a need to go into a you know traditional building or space or community has an important 
a, a particular impact in a region that is highly anti-institutional. So Cascadia is very anti-institutional. Anti so perhaps this bioregional impact can um, have even more of a, a presence because of that anti-institutional approach. Now, there are complicating factors to this idea of reverential naturalism being the default orientation. And there are just a few things that I would bring up. One is kind of one's access to fancy nature. So not all parts of the region do you have the same sort of access to that experience. And so people's um, lives might look a little bit different in terms of their relationship to the bioregion. Um, the other one that I think is really important and that I discuss in the chapter is class. Um, it's really difficult to afford to just live out here, period, and then to afford the kind of reverential naturalist approach to life, buying the hiking gear, having the time to go out and do these sorts of things is very classed. And so folks within our community or within our data set also spoke to this, like that this was a difficult thing to sometimes incorporate because they just didn't have the time or money to do so. And then there are tradition specifics where certain traditions or certain individuals from certain traditions in our um, project kind of spoke to there being particular traditions that were more um, hesitant to kind of do that creative, creative adaptation versus others. Um, and I'll stop there for now. And I'm really looking forward to our broader conversation. So thank you. Thanks, Rach. That was great. All right, so we have about um, 10, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, let's say 15 minutes um, to just hear from y'all. If you want to ask us questions, that's great. Um, if you want to share your own experiences or thoughts, that would be great too. Uh, Paige. Hi, thanks for that. That was great. I have uh, two questions, but I'm happy to just ask one for now. Ruby, you, you made a really interesting comment I found so curious and I don't know if it was sort of just a sort of off the cuff comment but you had said it's not really like a spiritual in the sort of way that it would be in Cascadia or as spiritual as it would be in Cascadia and I I mean what you were describing sounds very spiritual to me and I'm wondering like in that moment how you're defining spirituality in this particular instance what you meant by that, I guess. Yeah, so I, I guess what I was thinking of more in relation to what's happening in Cascadia, where you can literally say, I'm going for a hike and it's a spiritual experience. It doesn't have to be tied to a faith organization or a belief structure or anything like that. Whereas what I'm finding in Nova Scotia is that it's still institutionally based. It's still a physical building that is then incorporating the bioregion into the idea of spirituality. And so when you go to these places for the retreats, it's still tied to either Buddhism or the United Church or to the Catholic Church. And um, that never really gets separated, it's incorporated. And so the idea is that we're going to incorporate the idea of the land, of the watershed, of our location of nature into the idea of a bigger area of what it is to be a Catholic or what it is to be a Buddhist. And so I see it as being uh, slightly different than what we what Paul had written about in, in the book and a lot of the people looking at Cascadia, where you could literally just say by being out in nature, by being part of the bioregion and having that spirituality is enough to just be spiritual and not having it tied to a faith system. And that hasn't really happened yet in Nova Scotia. But, I mean, we live in a very beautiful area. Uh, Cape Breton Island is, you know, considered supposed to be like the, the number one place to ride a motorcycle or take up a car ride. You know, people come here from everywhere. But that idea of spirituality is not incorporated into the areas itself, separate from the institutions that have built spaces in these areas and said, we're not going to take advantage of the fact that we built in Pleasance Bay or Terrence Bay or Halifax. So that's the difference that I see in this particular instance. Can I Thank ask you. a very quick follow-up question? Do you, uh, okay. do you see that changing? Like the more yeah. that institutions incorporate uh, the out of doors, do you see people then starting to just associate the out of doors with spirituality separate from the institutions? I see it happening probably in the younger generations um, mm. where they are not affiliated with religious institutions. We have a lot of people who do not go to any or do not affiliate at all anymore in Nova Scotia, especially in Cape Breton Island, uh, especially with a lot of the problems we've had with the Catholic Church here. And so people have started looking for other avenues of spirituality. And so I think that eventually that will get tied into it. 
but there is, as Allison said, a lot of it is tied to money. These institutions are always looking for donations to keep them alive, to keep them open. And so they want people to come there and take these retreats and say that, yes, I got to enjoy the bioregion that I'm in and, and have that spiritual connection, but it still has to be tied to that institution still. And until we can actually get these areas, the, the bioregion of all of Nova Scotia really funded in a better way and made more accessible to people, I think that kind of limits the the way people go out and look for spirituality just in the bioregion itself and not tied to an institution. Great response, Ruby. Thank you. Uh, Matt, uh, great to see you. Are you in Germany or are you in uh, Canada? Uh, I'm, I'm in Germany. I'm in, I'm in Bonn. So yeah, ah. greetings, greetings from Bonn from, from several great hours ahead of y'all. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so my question is uh, fairly open-ended. Maybe whoever wants to take it. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has any thoughts about thinking about bioregionalism uh, in relation to Canada as a nation state. And what I have in mind here is, you know, being in Germany as a visiting professor for the last number of years, um, it's remarkable how easy it is to traverse this nation state. It's about half the size of Manitoba with 83 million people. You can hop on a train. You can get around really, really easily and get a feel for it. Um, in, in the region I am, um, the Rhineland, I mean, there is a sense of the Rhine as a river being a you know, part of people's identity, but it's easier to grasp the nation as a whole. Obviously, that's true here in Canada. So just curious if anyone has any thoughts on that, that connection. Yeah, it's, it's so often the case eh, that, that Europeans come to Canada and they think, well, I'll spend three days in Toronto and two days in Halifax and four <laughs> days in Victoria. It's like, well, you can do that, but I hope you're extremely wealthy so you can afford to fly everywhere because otherwise it's going to be murderously difficult getting around in this in this space. Um, they make You make a really good point. And I think one of the differences is that the, the regional, uh, especially between Quebec and the rest of Canada, I think that makes it somewhat more difficult to have that same kind of somewhat more unified imaginary that you find more in, in France or Germany, which are both A, because they're smaller, and B, because they're speaking the same language, um, is somewhat but, but, but easier. Paul, what, Although what that is a mat. Go ahead. But what you're saying, Paul, about Cascadia is kind of saying that you, you feel very specific in, in, in British Columbia, more mm -hmm. related to Washington, Washington State or are we so unique in Quebec with, with our specificity or? Mm -hmm. No, I'm actually thinking, I'm actually, uh, maybe I'm misreading Matt's question, but if, if part of what he's asking about is the movement throughout the Canadian nation state uh, and the sort of the national imaginary of Canada, I think one of the things that makes it somewhat different than, notably different than say Germany or, or France or Belgium, well, Belgium is a, different, a bad example, but Germany or France at least is this, is the, two solitudes or the tension between the English and French, which is, I'm not being critical of it, I'm just saying that just makes it a different scenario. But Pamela, I see Pamela wants to probably respond to some, the content of what I just said rather than a different thing. Just briefly, I would say, I thank you for that question, Matt. In my experience of specific places in Germany though, people are very, very tied to their Heimat and tied to their mm. dialect and tied to their sense of, you know, being from uh, Schwabia is very different from being from Bonn. So I think uh, then it, it does become an interesting question of how language is tied into um, the bio region as well, but it also becomes an uh, industrialization question, as Solange was pointing out. I mean, the, yeah. what what ac what actually gets extracted and what work gets done on the land, I think, is also a key thing to think about how um, how people have different identities in different parts of Canada as well. I have a uh, Judith Brunton, my student, is just finishing a dis an excellent dissertation on oil in Alberta and and. Under, understanding that really strongly as a, relig a religious studies question. So that's, I'll just stop there. Yeah, yeah, good point, Pamela, thank you. So let's go Diana, David, and Solange. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to all for this uh, wonderful presentations. I kind of really loved, you know, how, how Ruby was talking about also native traditions and then in the end in her comments also about Buddhism. And uh, I, I can also say that if, if we also look at other traditions that are present in Canada, for example, in Hinduism, we have like sacred geography. So the rivers, the mountains are deified that they're sacred. And with this respect, I wanted uh, to uh, uh, ask a question to Solange because 
I very much like Solange at the end how you kind of uh, spoke also about the native uh, uh, readings of the Quebec village and the um, uh, disruption, the disrupting of harmony and all that. But you kind of started with the village and the church. And I kind of would have expected you to start with native traditions or something at least saying, you know, like the mentioning the presence of indigenous people, you know, who preceded the church and, you know, this romantic uh, kind of uh, uh, viewing of the Quebec village. So can you say um, um, something more about that? Like, is it that different, you know, like, because, you know, from the perspective of uh, the indigenous people, I can imagine that this idyllic Quebec village and the church in a way also disrupt something as far back as the 16th century. Because according to me, native traditions are a little bit like Hinduism. There's like sacred geography and the, the relationship between nature and religion is different. So at least I think we should honor it or own it or mention it, you know? So uh, yeah, just a general Thanks, question to you. Solange, you want to, what, did you want to speak yeah, to that? It's, uh, Diana, thank you. Uh, it's precisely my point. <laughs> I, you know, I started with this uh, romantic image uh, very present, and I, I, I concluded with this uh, this rupture, uh, this rupture with the uh, what is surrounding the village, and it that is the indigenous are pointing out. Uh, so mm -hmm. yes, you, you uh, said it very uh, even uh, in a more elegant way. Uh, but just uh, you know, the question of Matt was very uh, interesting because, and, and the the the, the, the Paul's answer as well. It, it's the question of what is a nation. Mm -hmm. A nation is a very recent concept. So as Pamela said, uh, it's very diverse in Germany. It's the case in France as well and everywhere. In Italy is a very recent nation and Canada as well. But uh, so your question, Matt, uh, you know, because of nature, uh, we, we, uh, we, we can reflect on the, the diversity. Maybe for Anglophones in Canada, Quebec is like this reference uh, making them feel so unite. Maybe that's what I should hear from Paul. But uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, I can say that in Quebec, we don't even feel this unity because Quebec is so vast. Mm. Uh, we don't go. We, we, we don't visit the entire Quebec. We don't know it. It's, it's, it's an immense territory. So we, we, don't, we don't even control our own territory. It's, it's, it's too immense. So yeah. Europe is more, you know, organized, I would say that it, uh, it has more history, but uh, we don't see as so unite. Uh, but it's a good question, you know, how provocative it is eh, for our minds. So thank you. We should maybe next year, we can have a, a similar panel like this on yeah. kind of imagined communities um, and the, the way we think of the nation state, the way we think about um, the kind of concepts I think that underlie Matt's question. We're, we're just yes, getting close to the end of time, but I want to, for sure, David and Allison, um, please ask your questions. Okay. Uh, I'll be brief. I want to uh, pick up on something that Pamela and, has introduced and Rachel as well. And, and that's the, um, uh, the issue of, of uh, the economy uh, of each region having an impact uh, on, on this uh, question as well. Uh, Rachel said, uh, used the term uh, deinstitutionalization, um, de and that's very common in religious studies to talk about deinstitutionalization. In fact, it, I would prefer the term reinstitutionalization. When people stop going to church, it's not like they stop interacting with institutions. They go shopping, they go on vacation, they go, uh, they join sports leagues, they, they go to yoga, some of them fanatically. Uh, I'm not pointing fingers. Um, <laughs> the, um, so I, I wonder if, uh, we, if uh, people might reflect on, on that question. Pamela has touched on it, uh, and, and Rachel, in mentioning class, has touched on it. So perhaps they uh, could uh, lead us. What, one of the, can, I just want to point out one of the things I, I really liked about Allison's um, Allison's presentation is, is something that really struck me when I moved from the prairies to here, which is that she was quite right, I think, to point out how the, the really punishing, aggressive uh, winter does lead to a different kind of social reality, which is not the case here, where the 
permeable membrane between inside and outside is, or the membrane is just much more permeable in on the West Coast. So I think she's she's onto something there about the the and then you know Ruby's point about how the the institution is still kind of in the in the picture, right? And I think it's when the building in the in the case of Allison is so important to keep you alive, and the institution has deep roots. And in the case of Ruby, uh, on the East Coast, then it's still it still is a touch touchstone for your intellectual and your institutional life, which is more so the case than out here. Though you're not you're not wrong to talk about whether it's yoga or shopping or tourism, those are things out here, but there's a, they're, they're somewhat more uh, fluid than a space like a, a temple or a, a church. So we're at 12.32. I, I'm, uh, does anybody else want to add to that before we go to Allison's final question or comment? No. Okay, Allison, you, you get the last one. Oh, gee. Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to respond to Michael uh, Gillingham's question to me in the chat about Jane Jacobs theology, and that's that's pretty loaded. That's that's an entire paper um, that that I've I've presented before, um, and something I've been working on a little bit. But that has to do with. Um, the emergence of public policy departments across Canada in the 60s and Jane Jacobs theology that a lot of urban planners and my apologies to people who love urban planning um, you know they populate at least in Manitoba they populate a lot of municipal government um, and there's an increasing um, trend uh, in Canada, I don't want to generalize because I haven't done detailed studies in all um, provinces, uh, to implement many of Jane Jacobs' uh, ideas. Um, and I don't know if anybody's read Jane Jacobs, but she had some fairly preposterous um, ideas and it wasn't, it was more a passionate um, portrayal of the ideal urban city. And so you start to see that in the way that, for instance, in Winnipeg, you know, bike paths are taking precedence over fixing the potholes, which are horrendous this winter, and the gaps in roads on highways. Um, you have you have urban planners who very much, you know, reject religion and these institutions, but they love um, urbanism. So that's what I'm referring to there. Thanks, Allison. Oh, okay. Well, I think you can tell, and thanks, Michael, for that really good question. I, I think you can tell that we could continue talking about this for quite a while, but I want to I want to thank Allison, Pamela, Rachel, Solange, and, and Ruby uh, for being willing to speak about the regions where they live and where they where they study and play. Um, one thing I'm glad that it was quite interesting. Actually, I didn't really micromanage the content of people's talks. I just sort of said, "Hey, wouldn't it be great if you could each reflect on these general." ideas, but we really covered a lot of uh, interesting territory around history and geology and, uh, you know, uh, money. I'm really glad Allison brought up the question of donation and, and supporting buildings and so forth. So thanks. I think there's a lot to be said on this topic, and I look forward to future CSSRs for uh, continuing this discussion. And maybe, Matt, we can talk about a, a future session on imagined communities or the nation state and, and regionalism, because I think there's a lot going on there and we can definitely make some progress on that. Okay, take care everybody, see you again. <laughs>